Hello, my name's Gavin Wood. Um, thanks for having me at Unitize and greetings from Berlin. I'd like to take uh, my time today um, to talk a little about governance and uh, particularly Polkadot's um, governance since um, it will be launching uh, very soon now. It's around a month um, since we launched the first um, chain candidate for Polkadot, so basically the first um, um, attempt, hopefully the only attempt, and so far um, Polkadot's launch process is going uh, very well. We're in phase two at the moment, um, whereby we have switched to the um, nominated proof-of-stake consensus system, away from a, uh, originally a proof-of-authority consensus system, and um, we now have 200 validators um, who are maintaining the network processing blocks and transactions. The next stage will be the rollout of Polkadot's governance um, system, and I'm quite excited to tell you about it today. I think initially it's, it's helpful for us to talk a little bit about why governance is, is important. Um, so what is governance? Um, so governance is, um, you know, there's a few definitions that you can go by. Um, here's a couple of them. Governance is the way that rules, um, norms and actions are structured, sustained, regulated and held accountable. That's from Wikipedia. Um, the United Nations, on the other hand, says that governance has been defined as the rules of a political system to solve conflicts between actors and adopt decision. So, you know, in both of these definitions, we, we see that there's like a, a system of rules. We talk about rules. Um, rules about making decisions um, with the participants of those um, sort of decisions being held accountable. Um, so these rules, decisions and accountability seem to be fairly common throughout um, what uh, you know, uh, the mainstream definitions of govern governance are. In the context of technology, this decisions really tend to fall into the evolution of standards and, and protocols. There's, um, you know, there's not that much that can be um, decided upon. Um, if stay strictly within technology. And in the context of autonomous um, crypto economic systems, then decisions will fall basically to the evolution of the protocol itself. Um, and the rules are, well, because we want to, like, you know, have them be autonomously executed, they're going to be algorithmic, absolute, and machine executable. And accountability would be facilitated through machine-readable signed statements and transactions. So basically, we can form this, this, this triad of decisions, rules, and accountability by putting it all on chain. And blockchain seems a pretty solid thing, uh, direction to go in for um, you know, addressing what is generally recognized to be governance. So in short, what is governance? Well, it's the rules over the system rather than the rules within the system, right? And it's really important to, to understand the distinction between over the system and within the system, right? Within the system is, is like um, the rules for, to take a country as an example, like a typical rule of law country. Well, the rules within the system are the sort of rules that, that say what you are and aren't allowed to do um, uh, when you walk down the street, in terms of civil contracts, whatever, when you're interacting with everyone else in the world. But the rules over the system are the rules that basically allow us to alter the rules both over the system and within the system, right? So this is like your parliamentary democracy. This is about who are your elected representatives? How do those elected representatives determine and decide new laws? How does, the, how does the constitution get changed? What if you want to amend it? How do you vote in a president? What's the president, what, what's the, um, what are the restrictions of the power? How much power does a president have? How much power does Congress have? What happens when Congress and the president disagree? All of this stuff, these are rules over the system, right? Now, it, it, it might, you know, we kind of smudge them all together and just call it the law, but actually it makes a lot of sense to think of, well, what's, what part of the law is, is sort of able to change itself, the law in general, and what part of the law is just sort of by the by, running day by day, bread and butter stuff. 
Um, and as far as blockchain is concerned, so far at least, we've only done the by the by, day by day bread and butter stuff. We haven't really thought about how blockchain can be used as a means of actually evolving the rules of the blockchain, evolving this, the, the, the nature of the business logic of the blockchain. Decentralization and crypto prevent the corruption of these rules, of the, of the following of these rules. So obviously we should use them. Like, it makes no sense to have a system that can follow rules perfectly, regardless of who's trying to attack it or corrupt it, and yet not use it for governance. Secondly, decentralized, like these crypto economic systems, I think will become the new states of the internet, the new kind of nation states. I think they will look much less like dumb assets and much more like real governments, um, real nations with various apparatus of state contained within them. At the, you know, when Bitcoin came out, there was like the, the military in some sense, the, the miners, right? They were providing the security for Bitcoin. They were the ones preventing like, for example, rogue Litecoin miners from double spending by, uh, you know, 51% attacking the Bitcoin chain. Um, and it also had a notion of currency, right? Bitcoin could mint its own currency. So it had two elements that are very, very um, directly identifiable as a nation state. Well, it's, in my mind, there will be many more than two elements in the not too distant future. We will see blockchain ecosystems, blockchain crypto economic systems sporting various other apparatus of state. One of the things that these blockchain, these sort of nation states do, they have to keep embassies up. They have to interact with other nation states, right? Because it's in everybody's interest. If I interact with you, we can do a deal. We both benefit, benefit against everybody else. The isolatist, the isolationist states tend not to do very well. The trading states tend to do much better. So we need decentralized, we need governance in this, these decentralized crypto and economic systems to be able to speak for the aggregated state, the aggregated blockchain nation state. I have to manage outward relations somehow. And finally, my third sort of point in all of this, why bother, um, is, well, decentralized crypto economic systems, the blockchains, these blockchain economies control huge amounts of value, hundreds of millions sometimes. Billions, occasionally. These are economic heavyweights, right? And it makes no sense for this huge amount of market capitalization not to be put to use. Yeah, it's like, well, there's obviously a lot of some skepticism in some corners about precisely to what degree it's, it's, um, it's acceptable to put um, this market capitalization to use. But ultimately, if the point of a system, a point of this system is to, is to, to survive, um, then it should do whatever it can. It should use whatever it can use to do that. Now, if we had rules that said, well, actually you can spend 0.01% of your market capitalization each year on something that will help make um, it more, you know, the chain more valuable, it's a simple business decision. It's a simple cost benefit. Yes, well, you know, if it can make it more valuable than it costs for that, that 0.01% costs and that any indirect effects of taking that 0.01% out or inflating 0.01% um, would have, then you would do it. Like it's, it's as simple as that. So governance is critical. Governance is the basic of the means of speaking out as on behalf of the crypto economic system as a way of the internal elements, the internal stakeholders of the crypto economic system coming together and uh, determining what this 0.01% should be. Maybe it's that, maybe it's 0.1%, maybe it's 0.001%, maybe it's 0%, maybe they really don't want to um, uh, do anything. But nonetheless, it should be a decision made by the stakeholders. It's not enough just to say, eh, well, we decided in our protocol that it will never be done. Um, because if every protocol does that and one protocol doesn't, it's likely that one protocol will win out just by being more flexible. Now, you know, in terms of uh, if we think about autonomous governance, blockchain governance, it's important to remember that just as much as you know, blockchain isn't the same as Bitcoin, 
um, autonomous governance isn't the same as coin voting. This no notion of like autonomous on-chain um, governance is not, it's not fair to characterize it um, as simply you know, coin voting. Um, indeed, there's an awful lot more to it than coin voting, although coin voting may be sort of an initial example of it. Um, so why do we bother with governance? What's the point? Well, it's pretty clear that in today's world, products that can't evolve and adapt and improve over time um, become increasingly irrelevant. It's not enough for a product to be um, a market leader initially. The product must continue um, to innovate and improve, particularly in the domain of services and software. Um, if we, uh, even when we look towards hardware, we're increasingly seeing products that um, continually improve. They're usually over, um, given more hardware than, or more devices, uh, more um, components than are technically required for their original sort of purpose. Um, sort of over-specified, if you like, but the software evolves to take increasingly greater advantage of the, uh, the hardware components. Now with software systems, of course, you know, they can evolve into pretty much anything. Um, it's governed only by the rules of logic. And we increasingly see you know, software and service, um, software service companies push out upgrades and uh, innovations that uh, massively alter the product proposition. So how do we use the blockchain to automate governance? It's non-trivial actually, it's, 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 it's worth um, sort of pondering on this. Um, because blockchains are rule systems, and because the rule systems um, will typically build in um, the stuff about consensus and the stuff about the business logic, unspent transaction outputs or accounts or smart contracts, <clears throat> all of this stuff, it's difficult for these rules to be combined with the rules that sort of govern how it should be upgraded. It's like kind of two different levels. You've got the rules that govern day-to-day -day bread and butter stuff, smart contracts and, and, and transfers and transactions and all that sort of stuff. But you also need the rules that can change that stuff and also change the, the, the rules for changing that stuff. Ugh, it all gets very mind-boggling. It's no surprise that we haven't really kind of invented it yet because it's actually quite sort of odd, it's strange, it's recursive, right? So if we look at how the traditional model, Bitcoin, Ethereum and so on, then we've got this protocol and then we've got sort of, you know, some cloud of indecision eventually. It has lots of sort of people voting or, 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 or with sentiment in lots of different directions. And um, the traditional model is for them basically ultimately, I mean, be very, very slow, not really very, um, nothing really happening, and then to slowly fork off in different directions. And we've seen that with Ethereum, you know, there's a, uh, forks of Ethereum, there's you know, numerous forks of Bitcoin, um, basically because governance didn't deliver, right? There was no way of, of, of the stakeholders coming together under a common rule set and working out what decision should actually be made and what timeline and all the rest of it. Well, Polkadot is a meta protocol. Now, what this means is the only bit that's actually fixed in Polkadot is, is the very, very, very bottom, right? The bit that we don't have any of the parachain stuff or smart contracts or even balances or balance transfers. None of this stuff exists at the meta protocol level. The meta protocol level is the very, very basic building blocks. Um, that you can build something like Polkadot with. It doesn't really define anything except very basic um, uh, uh, kind of notion on how to agree on a, the history of a, 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 the blockchain history, right? But it doesn't have anything, any say in what the blocks mean, what the transactions do. It doesn't even really know about transactions. And it's... It's in this meta protocol, this very low level thing, this very basic thing, that we implement the rest of Polkadot. We implement things like balances and accounts, right? We implement the notion of transactions. We implement things like the governance. 
We implement things like the treasury. We implement things like parachains. Um, all of this goes, actually it sits on top of the underlying protocol, just in the same way that you can upload smart contracts to Bitcoin or have an account, uh, upload smart contracts to Ethereum or have an account on Bitcoin. It, 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 it sits inside of this protocol, inside of the, the outer protocol, the meta protocol, and can be changed by the meta protocol, right? Now it can just tell the meta protocol to change itself so the meta protocol doesn't change, but it doesn't need to change because it's so general, it's so abstract. But the things that, that make Polkadot Polkadot actually sit within the meta protocol and they can be changed, right? So this allows Polkadot to upgrade itself autonomously with no, completely seamlessly. One block, it's that Polkadot, Polkadot V1, and then bang, the next block, it's Polkadot V2, just like that. Nothing, no one had to upgrade any nodes. There was no um, decision on the part of validators whether they should continue validating on Polkadot or not. It was as if by magic the network just decided in and of itself to become a new network, to do new stuff, different stuff. Now, why has governance taken so long to be introduced? It seems like if I'm convincing you it's a good idea, then how come it's, it, 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 we're still sort of waiting for a major crypto economic system to have any kind of decent governance? Well, it's firstly a very uh, clear indicator that this is an immature ecosystem. 10 years since Bitcoin has passed, five years since Ethereum um, has, has been launched. You know, it, it, it's not that long. I mean, it's a fairly long period of time in, in, in software engineering perhaps, but it's, it's not so long if we think about it in terms of you know discovering an entire subject. It was always unclear, even back when we were sort of trying to design Ethereum, um, what requirements there might be for future compatibility. Like how, what we would need in order to ensure that the chain upgrades. I remember being asked um, back in a meetup in Silicon Valley in early 2014 about how we would manage upgradability for Ethereum. The answer was a sort of shrug of the shoulders. We don't, you know, the protocol will just manage itself. If people want to hard fork it, then it will get hard forked, it will get upgraded. But it's not a sufficiently good answer because there has to be some um, effective way of, of deciding, determining um, when something should be hard forked taking into account the feelings and the convictions of the stakeholders. And it's, it, it, yeah, it's not clear. It was also fairly unclear to us that there would be much of a need to upgrade. We, was, we were sort of fervent in our belief that Ethereum would be, there'd be sort of only one real proper upgrade, Ethereum 1 to Ethereum 2, when it would be scalable. And, um, and that would take some amount of time, maybe two or three years. We were optimistic then. Um, before uh, uh, and so yeah why yeah why would we spend a lot of time trying to consider this in retrospect I think it was a valid sort of position to take we had many other more important things to be considering but time has passed and it's time to sort of address this shortfall this shortcoming let's talk a little about Polkadot's um, governance Polkadot's autonomous governance there are three real sort of key things to, to think about, um, to, to sort of understand. Stake-weighted referenda, um, which I'll talk about in a, in a little while. Um, approval voted uh, council, and an endowed treasury. So let's talk a little bit about the referenda. So Polkadot allows arbitrary changes within its core. So the core blockchain that is Polkadot can actually be changed, upgraded, if you like, in entirely arbitrary ways. Um, this is, you know, pretty clear from the fact that we've already been upgrading it. Uh, and the first chain candidate, admittedly, but but still, we've been upgrading it. We've been upgraded it from a proof of authority chain to a proof of stake chain. Um, we're going to be upgrading it to introduce all of this governance stuff. And we added multiple pieces of functionality, um, freshly coded and audited. Um, even during these last four weeks. So the fact that we can have arbitrary changes to the Polkadot sort of core protocol is, 
uh, is a relatively uh, new thing in, in the blockchain world. As far as I'm aware, only one other protocol can do something similar, um, and it doesn't really implement it in um, in a uh, uh, in a way that provides quite so much um, flexibility and performance as Polkadot. However, it's important to um, manage the power of being able to alter your core protocol um, with uh, you know, an appro appropriate amount of safety. We put everything through, all of these changes have to go through referendum. What do we mean by a referendum? Well, basically, there are one, one of these referendums happens per month. Um, alternate months come from different sources, um, two different sources. Um, the council is one source, which I'll talk about in a little while, and the public form another source. There's a public queue that allow the pub, uh, any basically any member of the public, permissionless, um, to put forth a proposal for how Polkadot should change. So it's one month council, one month public, one month council, one month public. Then there's one, the, the votes um, um, uh, within a, for a referendum lasts um, the voting period lasts one month, um, so that's just one month to, to decide which way you're going to go, I or nay. Referendums are always I or nay, they're always just binary decisions. Um, and then once the counting is finished, uh, so once this month is, is complete um, and there is a decision made, if it is in favour of the change, um, then it will still be that change will be delayed by one month, so there'll be a one month enactment delay, we call it. Um, so it won't happen, it won't actually be, um, uh, the change won't go through for some time afterwards. Um, there is another governance body, like as well, a governance body aside from referendum, referendums, um, called the council. And the council is the, uh, a body of, of delegates, a body of people that have been um, voted in from the, the, the token holders um, that basically have the power to do a few things. They have the power to, to spend from the treasury, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but they also have the power to introduce um, votes. We elect them using the same mechanism that we use for the staking uh, system, um, notably the FRAGMEN algorithm. Um, and it's essentially an approval vote. So each token holder can approve of one or more council members, and the one with the most approvals sort of um, gets in. From the point of view of the voter, you just pick a number of council members that you're happy uh, with going in and um, the system will kind of allocate your the votes according to um, an optimization uh, mechanism in order to get the most approved of uh, councillors elected. Now the council, the abilities of the council are pretty, pretty simple. Um, the main one is that 50% of the time it can push out a, um, uh, a proposal, so every other month. Um, the council is able to um, to table a proposal for how Polkadot should be changed. Um, and if it's, uh, and the other 50% is, is by the public queue, which I already mentioned, if more than 60% of the council agree, then um, that proposal will become a, a majority carriers proposal. So one way you just compare I's and A's votes. Pretty, um, um, yeah, which w we would expect the council to be, you know, reasonably well agreed much of the time. Not always, we've seen in Kusama there are times that the council is split, but I think a lot of the time, especially for very um, uncontroversial upgrade proposals, the council will tend to be um, uh, close to unanimous. There's usually one dissenter or one non-voter. Um, in addition, the council can veto a public proposal. It can only veto it once, so if the public continue to um, propose um, this motion, this change, um, the council can't, can't veto it indefinitely, but it can veto it once. This is mostly in case there are sort of um, known malicious proposals, so the council can weed them out. Um, in case something just gets through, <clears throat> maybe there's not much in the queue, and someone um, very close to when the thing is chosen from the top of the queue very quickly, um, um, you know, puts in a bit of stake and makes sure that theirs gets selected. Um, the council can basically wipe it off. Finally, on the, in terms of the governance bodies, there's the technical committee. Now this is sort of an extra um, governance body in addition to the, the council, the Polkadot council. Um, 
It's, um, it's smaller at the moment. It's only got three members. It's appointed by the council members, so it's not voted in. Um, under the uh, sort of assertion that it should be uh, appointed according to expertise of the protocol. Now, the rough rule that we've given, and it is really only a rough rule, um, it's not something that can be enforced in the protocol, uh, but the rough rule is that the research team at the Web3 Foundation gets one vote, um, so one seat reserved for them, and every team that fully implements either a Polkadot client or the Polkadot runtime, the, the sort of um, the business logic of Polkadot, parachains and all that sort of stuff, um, gets one vote uh, for each of those two things. So in principle, a uh, uh, development team, if they've fully implemented Polkadot, like the parity development team has, would get two votes. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and those, that, that, those people, those seats, um, form the technical committee. Now, the only other thing I want to talk about is the treasury. I mentioned it earlier. Um, so the treasury is a pot of money on chain. It's controlled by uh, the council. Um, the majority, a majority decision of the council can spend money from the treasury. And it can, uh, it's funded basically by transaction fees, by the inefficiencies of the staking reward system. So basically if, if the staking um, situation is non-optimal, which most of the time it won't be, but it might get quite close, um, then the, uh, a lower reward will be paid out to each, um, to each staker um, than what they would otherwise get the optimal um, configuration of the staking system. Now, this means that um, there's some extra reward, assuming that we stick to our 10% per year inflation rate, which means that that extra reward would just fund the treasury. In addition to that, it also gets um, the bits and bobs from like um, slashing. So if there are any slashes, then that goes to the treasury as well. Um, the, the treasury is designed really to provide, much like, as I mentioned, you know, the governance apparatus of a nation state, the treasury is there to sort of um, invest or, uh, or um, in some sense, improve um, the, uh, the network, the network's ecosystem, the network's facilities. Um, it can be um, a fund to sponsor software development. It can be a fund to sponsor um, awareness or education efforts. Um, it can be a fund to sponsor research. Basically, anything that could help make Polkadot better, um, the Polkadot Treasury is there to support. And the council is there as a means of deciding what counts as a good idea um, to be supporting or not. Um, it's already got quite a lot of funds in it. I think uh, I last checked. Um, uh, in fact, I can, I can check right now. <sighs> Uh, the Treasury has, as of right now, 40,051 dots in it. Um, so a fairly substantial chunk of cash, um, given that it's only been going for about, um, what, 500,000 blocks, um, four weeks or so. Um, it's, and it's there to be spent. Um, if it doesn't get spent, it gets burnt. Um, at the moment, I think it's only about 5%, or maybe even less, 1%, that gets burnt every mm, three or four weeks. Um, but in principle, like, you know, it's there to be spent. And, uh, uh, and I hope that it will be used um, uh, wisely and well. I think, uh, you know, we've got some uh, indication that it is going quite nicely. Um, uh, it is quite, sort of being used quite well within the Kusama network. Um, we're seeing some really uh, interesting stuff um, coming from uh, the treasury spending, um, and although it's uh, you know it, it sort of was reasonably slow um, about a year ago, it is when when Kusama launched, it is um, improving and increasing uh, its spending on a you know sort of uh, week by week basis. That's it for me. Uh, that's uh, that's all I have to say for now. I hope you found it. Um, illuminating um, a little um, and I hope you have a better idea now of what we're trying to uh, achieve and how we're trying to achieve it um, with Polkadot. Um, have a great rest of the conference. Thanks.